Disclaimer. This video's script was written and recorded before City of the Wolves trailer dropped. Consider it a period piece. Garo, Mark of the Wolves 2 is upon us. It's rapidly approaching. It's already been almost a year since its big unveiling at EVO 2022. Since they only showed a piece of concept art and used the word greenlit, I assumed this was a project that would be a ways away from being officially sort of, you know, announced. But then they showed off another piece of concept art, and now I'm wondering whether or not we'll be seeing more of it at EVO this year. Maybe it's further along than I initially thought. In that case, I think now is the time to fully divulge my wish list and reveal my extremely high expectations and personal unrealistic dreams pertaining to this game. And while I use the word wish list, what this video really ended up snowballing and then mutating into was a complete fan wank pitch. I'm going to be discussing almost every area of the game and uh, just giving my thoughts on what I think, you know, could be done. Obviously, it's not going to be a... This isn't a video where I'm like, this is what SK needs to do and if they don't do this, I don't like it. It's just, in some hypothetical world where I have control over Garo 2, this is what I would do with it. Oh, and uh, if you didn't like Street Fighter 6, you should probably just click off the video now. I wouldn't blame you. Because I absolutely love it, and it does a ton of stuff I really want to see Garo 2 do, so if you happen to hate the direction SF6 took, you're probably going to hate the direction I'm proposing for Garo 2. But before I get to all of that, let's just take a minute and get ourselves up to speed on what we know about the sequel to Garo Mark of the Wolves already. Garou Mark of the Wolves 2 began life in 1999, shortly after the first game was finished, and was likewise being developed for the Neo Geo. The game was getting on with its development fine, and at the turn of the millennium was fairly near to completion. But what do we know about SNK and the year 2000? <laughs> Yeah, according to Val Kuhn, director of the Maximum Impact KOF titles and man who drew this image, the game was around 70% done when suddenly SNK went tits up and the project was shelved. And the only proof of the game we had for years was this crusty screenshot showing the roster, all the veterans from the first game as well as a bunch of new faces. However, in mid-2022, a demo disc was unearthed and a bunch of assets from the game were dumped online including sprite sheets, unfinished stages, concept art, etc. We got an overall look at all the new characters that were going to be included and, uh... Uh, yeah, sure, okay. I'm not saying it's good that this game got shit canned, but a lot of these new faces do not entice me. That said, I would bring some of them over to the new game, which I'll touch on later. Regardless, only a couple months after the leak, SNK revealed at EVO 2022 that a new Fatal Fury slash Garo game had been greenlit. And while details on this new title have been sparse, a few things have been revealed about it. First of all, it is going to be a 3D game, so all you sprite weirdos can go back into hiding. You and your KOF 13 sprite edits. And they clarified that it is a new project and not a continuation of the sequel that got axed in 2000. That said, they didn't deny the possibility of content from the old game making its way into the new one. They also mentioned a focus on single player content which, by Christ, KOF 15 did not have. And we know of six characters who will at least feature in the game. I mean, they're probably all playable, but we only know for sure that technically one character is confirmed as playable, and that's Terry Bogard, who was explicitly said to be in the game. But the rest of the characters are Rock, Kane, Billy, Terry, Andy, and Joe. And, uh, can I just get this out of the way? I really hope this is just like a placeholder design for Joe. Jesus Christ. Okay guys, we're reimagining Joe for the new Garo game set 10 years in the future. Any ideas? What has 10 years done to Joe Higashi, the Muay Thai champ? Uh, what if he put on a jacket? Kiss my ass. Andy, on the other hand, looking fly as a motherfucker. I think maybe the outfit is a little plain, maybe missing something. It's not the direction I would personally go with Andy, but I'd be lying if I said I didn't dig this at least a little bit. Maybe it just looks really good next to Joe's redesign, I don't know. At the very least, it confirms that they are changing characters' designs, which is a big thing I really wanted them to do. I mean, imagine if all the veteran Fatal Fury characters came over and they just have their regular designs after 10 years and nothing changes. It'd be shit. But apart from that, I believe that's everything they've said about the game to date, so now we can actually get to the real video. What does my whiny, entitled, perpetually fucking discontented ass want Garo 2 to be like? I'm glad you asked. So that I don't end up jumping between topics constantly and just generally waffling on about garbage, I've split this video up into six key sections. Basic goals, art direction, music and UI vibe, story mode, gameplay mechanics, and of course, the juicy part, the roster. ROSTERS! Sorry, old habits die hard. So let's start from the top. 
This might seem a little bit of a strange thing to talk about, but what is this new Garo title really aiming to do? Well, judging by SNK's CEO talking about plans to expand the company and to become a top 10 industry developer in 10 years, we want a game that helps catapult Fatal Fury and SNK itself further into the mainstream. If there's one SNK IP that could really accomplish that, I think it's Fatal Fury with its slew of iconic characters. They should be aiming to create something that can stand strong beside its contemporaries such as Street Fighter, Tekken, Mortal Kombat. Guilty Gear managed to break into the mainstream after years of being an obscure fighter, with Strife being such a smash hit. So it's time for SNK to prove that they can make the same magic happen. You know, hypothetically. So what do we need in order for that to happen? Well, that should be obvious. What's the first thing everyone looks at and judges a new fighting game by? Yeah, sing it with me now. The graphics! I won't mince words. I feel like KOF 15's final art style wasn't a specific envisioned visual style that they planned to achieve, but instead is more of a compromise, like, this is the best we could get it to look while keeping in mind budget, all the characters included, etc. Now I could be totally wrong, but that's just the vibe I get. And the reason I think that is because KOF 14, which is a game where you can just sort of feel the amount of ambition they had, you know, looking at the art book and stuff, looks more in line with how you'd expect a new generation 3D KOF to look. Yeah, the actual technical side of things was subpar with the rough character modelling and just, I don't know, the game just didn't end up looking good. But I think there was a stronger, you know, concept of how they wanted this game to look behind it. And it was more true to the original sprite work of the classic KOF games pre-12, with how everything was pretty rooted in realism with a hint of anime, as opposed to 15 being super bright with these really exaggerated character proportions. It just, I don't know. It looks okay, it's passable, but it's not gonna- I don't think anyone's gonna look at KOF 15 and be like, Wow, this game looks great. Like I said before, I took one look at Strive, no prior background with Guilty Gear, and thought it looks cool. That's all it takes. But I'm starting to get off track. While it's true that by the real belt games, Fatal Fury had started to carve out a similar super colourful look, it's apparent that Mark of the Wolves wanted to dial it back a bit and lean on realism again. And this is the direction I want the sequel to go, especially with Street Fighter 6 and Tekken 8 producing some really impressive realistic visuals with their sleek and modern game engines. It's definitely the best art direction that will get casual audiences going, Ooh, wow, this game looks nice. SF6 in particular is proving that you can do colour and realism in tandem and have it look super good. Which pretty much perfectly reflects what later Fatal Fury games are going for in my opinion. So now the big question is, can we even expect SNK to be capable of delivering great visuals akin to the recent efforts from their rivals? Well, I'd wager it's less a matter of if they can, and more a matter of they have to. If they want this game to be a success, it has to meet the bar that's been set. And I don't mean an SNK well it's good enough success. I mean a Strive success where it launches a niche franchise into the fucking stratosphere and permeates the cultural awareness of the wider FGC. There's not really much more I can add to be honest, but I'll stress it again. I really want this game to look good. Sometimes when I'm playing Street Fighter 6, I'll just stop and look in the matchmaking character selection screen and just gawk at the character models and think, I want to see Fatal Fury characters with this level of fidelity so bad. Now I really don't know if SNK is able to make graphics that look as good as SF6. But if they're gonna do all this expanding of the company, backing from the story shit, they better be prepared to not fall at the first hurdle, which is, like it or not, the graphics. I mean, shit, what kind of shoestring budget did Arika have for fighting EX Layer? And that game still has, like, the best 3D depiction of Terry Bogard ever. If they can do it, SNK should be able to do it. As for music, there's a couple different directions they could go. Guilty Gear Strive had vocal character themes, and I think that would be cool for Fatal Fury. I mean, they've already shown an interest in that with, uh, that song in KOF 15. Although I mostly just bring this up because sometimes as I'm listening to music in my own personal playlist, I catch myself imagining them as hypothetical character themes for Gara. I'm not gonna say what they are though, that'd be embarrassing. But to be honest, while I think vocal themes for some characters could work really well, there's others where I just can't imagine vocals really adding much or even making sense for the kind of character they are at all. Street Fighter 6 has a dynamic soundtrack, where the music changes depending on what's happening on screen, with variations in the music depending on what round it is, how much health you have, and even transition parts in between rounds. When the character themes for SF6 started coming out, I was with a lot of people and thinking, what the fuck is this garbage? But after playing the game, I have warmed up to a lot of them significantly. They take on more reserved approaches for the most part, and are less traditional video game character themes, and could honestly fit in like a movie fight scene or some shit. They sit in the background and complement the gameplay in a really unique way, like down to specifically highlighting character playstyles, I feel. For example, I thought absolutely nothing of Kami's theme, Overtrip, when I first heard it in a character trailer, and then again on YouTube. 
but after picking her up in-game, holy crap does this theme immerse me into the fight. It just perfectly reflects the extremely precise and calculated gameplay Kami has and just ends up making me focus really hard. Now the caveat to this is that you don't really get a soundtrack that is super impressive and full of great tracks, which is something SNK specializes in. So honestly, their usual approach of just creating fucking bangers works for me. That's something that I'll never worry about SNK's ability to do. I kind of just wanted to talk about SF6's soundtrack for a bit, to be honest. <laughs> but for a video like this, what I think is more important than the actual soundtrack itself is the general vibe of the game. You know, the aesthetics, the mood, that kind of thing. SF6 has the urban hip-hop shit going on, and that aesthetic bleeds through in all aspects of the game, in the menus, the pre-fight cutscenes, the art direction, hell, even the gameplay mechanics. It is everywhere, and the game has an extremely strong identity because of it. And honestly, that identity would work really well for Fatal Fury as well, since the germ of both franchises are so similar. But at the risk of being accused of just copying Street Fighter, I'd suggest going for something a little different. And you know, I think the answer is right in front of us if we just think about it for a second. Garo 2, assuming it takes place within a similar time frame of the original, which, why wouldn't it? is set in the mid-2000s. 2006 to be precise. And we've got a cast of a bunch of young people, with a protagonist who is kind of an edgy little insecure emo. So what were young people into during the mid-2000s? Yeah, that motherfucking gritty, post-grunge, edgy butt rock shit. Black and maroon, concrete walls, steel, rust, white graffiti, fucking Shadow the Hedgehog. That way we keep the urban tone, but swerve in a different direction overall. Will some people hate this? Probably. Maybe. Will a lot of others resonate with it? I think so. I made a little shitty mock-up. I mean, this looks like total garbage, but it does, I think, communicate this sort of aesthetic I'm talking about here, so... I'm not saying this is how the game should look, god forbid, but I am saying this is the sort of vibe that I think would work well. And in fact, I made this mock-up using mostly assets from the Code Mystic's port of Garo. I think Garo already plays into this aesthetic, except all the menus have this, like, piss yellow colour, which, you know, I'll probably change for this nice, you know, sort of darkish maroon red. I'm like 50-50 on this, because on one hand I think it's an identity that actually makes a lot of sense and would work really well, and on the other hand I think it's extremely funny ironically. Like in SF6 the character select has this rap track about, you know, grinding, working hard to better yourself every day and shit. Garo 2 you hop into the game and get blasted with crawling by Linkin Park. It's honestly not even a massively different musical style to the main themes of KOF 14 and 15, I reckon you can get those guys to pull off this shit really well. You might be thinking this is kind of a weird thing to talk about in a wishlist video, but like, if a game has a really, you know, strong aesthetic or vibe or whatever the hell you want to call it, that can help carry that game for years and make it so memorable. And honestly, I don't know what other aesthetic Garo 2 would even go for. I mean, you might not think this is like a good idea, but the alternative is to have the game be boring with no real theme or, or aesthetic. I mean, look at the KOF 15 menu screen. What feelings am I supposed to feel from that? What aesthetic is this going for? Even the character select, which looks good, doesn't really communicate anything to me. It's just sort of generic. Looks good, but doesn't make me feel anything. Oh, and also, since I can't figure out where else to put this, I want an English dub. I think maybe we need an English dub. Every big budget fighting game has a dub now. There's really no reason for SK not to try one. I know they haven't had a great history of dubs, but come on. Just because KOF 12 sucked, doesn't mean that every consecutive SNK dub will suck. I see that argument way too much that, like, because a company tried an English dub once and it didn't work out, it should never be tried again. It just doesn't work as a concept. It's just a really stupid argument. And, you know, if you just want to add that little cherry on top, see how many of the OVA casts you can get on board. Mark Hildreth as Terry again. Fucking Paul Dobson, Billy Kane, baby! You're drunk. Go sleep it off in your room. I'm pretty sure they all work in the industry still, apart from, like, Geese. But he's not even- he's not even- he's dead. Not as in the actor's dead, Geese is dead. I mean, if you have Geese show up at any point, just get his Tekken voice actor, I quite like his performance, but yeah. English dub, do it, have it on my desk by morning. 
So moving on to the story slash single player content, this is something SNK has already said is of specific interest to them with this game, which is a good sign. And Christ, do we need some good signs right now, because holy shit, Jesus Christ on a bicycle, KOF 15 single player content sucks. Bare bones as fuck arcade mode, and uh, the combo trials, each character gets five. Oh, and the boss challenge, take on an array of bosses such as Rugal, Genitz, yeah, that's it. Maybe you'll get to fight Chrysalid within a year. Oh, you think Reverse and Otamaraga should be included in this mode? Yeah, I'll, I'll file you on the dumbass. Look, it's just the absolute minimum effort possible in KOF 15, I feel. This is the same company that back in the day pioneered narrative-driven fighting games. Yeah, it was in a pretty primitive way, but come on, these were early 90s arcade titles. Now, I'm not gonna sit here and pretend I have the answer to the age-old question of how do you make fighting games have good single-player campaigns, but I will say that I think the most successful attempt in the history of the genre just happened with Street Fighter VI's World Tour. While a little rough around the edges, it's a pretty damn engaging mode that I only haven't beaten because I feel obligated to record my playthrough for some dumb reason. It certainly seems like the normie response to it has been super positive, so I mean shit, just copy their homework. It'd be worth it for a complete 3D recreation of Southtown alone. I don't know precisely what the actual story of Garo 2 would be. If you remember from the first game, Kane had Southtown declared as a city-state or independent or whatever. And he also told Rock that his mother was alive, leading him to begrudgingly join his side. So the pieces are in place for a pretty cool story to take place, I think. You know, it could be uh, about Rock's uh, moral dilemma of being with Kane. Or if you should go back to Terry and, you know, he could make these choices, maybe you could have a split path. Shadow of the Hedgehog style, why have I brought that game up twice? But that alone isn't, you know, really like a story, if you get what I mean. But I'll leave the details of that up to SNK. Although you know me, I do have some ideas as to how I think it should go. As I mentioned, Mark of the Wolves ends with the cliffhanger of Kane revealing his sister and Rock's mother, Marie Heinlein, or Heinlein, I still don't know, is still alive. Now, Rock's main characterization and dilemma, or whatever you want to call it, focuses on this dual lineage of his, struggling to overcome the evil force inside of him that comes from geese or whatever. Whether it's more of a literal or metaphorical thing, it's a burden he struggles with. He despises geese for abandoning his mother when he was young and letting her succumb to an illness that caused her death. Now I've always found this odd, since geese went through the very same thing when he was a child where his mother was left to die by his father, Rudolf Krauser, and he was disowned by him. So why would he repeat the behaviour of his father? What I'm proposing is that Rock's evil boiling blood does not come from Geese, but instead his mother, Marie. After all, Kane has similar powers and has all these sinister intentions, so I think the big revelation in the story could be that Geese staged Marie's death in order to protect Rock from her. He may have done it in a completely shitty way that fucked up Rock regardless, but it does add some humanity to a character who is usually solely depicted as a cold, ruthless bastard. And it completely flips Rock's perspective of his father on its head and helps him overcome the hatred he's been wrestling with. And then maybe Marie is evil and Rock faces her and he fights with his, his powers inherited from Geese or whatever, be this big dramatic thing. Maybe Terry comes in to help and Andy and Joe and they'll fuck up Marie and Kane. Fuck yeah! Tell me that's not a good fucking ending! <coughs> I don't know. I just think it'd be a neat way to tie up the groundwork Mark of the Wolves 1 laid. They'll probably do nothing like this though. I bet they'll kill off Terry for no reason or some shit. I oh, and also have Terry and Rock fight at some point, obviously. Shit for the trailers, innit? Moving on to the actual gameplay aspect of the story mode, what I personally think would be cool is to have like a story mode that features multiple campaigns. Maybe in one you take control of Team Fatal Fury reuniting, maybe gathering information about Kane, trying to put a stop to his exploits against the city, something along those lines. It could also act as a vehicle to have new players get caught up to speed of the lore of the franchise. Maybe you could, you know, a Team Fatal Fury uh, campaign could focus on the past and what's happened in the franchise, while a second campaign could focus on Rock working with Kane and move the story along more. You know, he would be doing whatever working with Kane entails. I don't know. What does, what does Kane want Rock to do? Do some evil shit. It would really take some manpower and kink ironing out to come up with something that really works, and since I'm not on the dev team, I'm not gonna bother. But I think the opportunity to craft a really cool narrative and fun story mode is here, and I hope to god they don't squander it with a basic ass arcade run where you nonsensically fight members of the cast in random stages with a couple cutscenes sprinkled throughout. They could have two main hubs like World Tour, the original South Town and Second South Town, both faithfully recreated using their existing maps as reference. There could also be smaller areas as well, maybe we take control of Andy Bogard for some time and he's in Japan at the Shirinui Dojo or visiting Tung Fu Ru in China or something. The hub worlds could be littered with collectibles like music, artwork, hell, even costumes as rewards for exploring or completing minigames or fights. 
the main story wouldn't even have to be that amazing, as long as it's just fun to explore the maps. Now when I initially came up with the idea of finding costumes in a single player mode, I thought to myself, in theory, yeah, that would be nice, but obviously it's never going to happen in today's industry. But then shortly after I wrote that, it was revealed that SF6 would have all its Player 2 costumes unlockable through normal gameplay means. Yes, they take a ton of fucking grinding and you can also purchase them, but holy fuck, in-game fucking unlockables. So yeah, have them as rewards for playing the story. You could hide CDs or something that contain all the past games OSTs for use in verse mode and online. High quality artwork collected from all past games, it'd be just really fucking cool. They could be tied to specific areas too, let's say you run down to Sound Beach and explore a bit, and you find Big Shot's music track in Terry's Fatal Fury 3 artwork. You could have stuff like the arm wrestling game from Fatal Fury 1, ice shattering and bottle cap minigames from Art Fighting. The possibilities are not endless, but plentiful. Now it's definitely true that not every character is super story important, so they might get unfairly shafted or left out of the spotlight, but the good thing about Garo is that for the most part, a lot of it is interconnected. You've obviously got the main conflict of Terry, Kane and Rock, and they're also bringing in Billy. Terry will have Andy and Joe by his side, Andy being there ropes in Hokutamaru and Mai, I'm sure Mary will play some sort of role so that brings in Kevin. The Hotaru and Gata plot is connected to Kane, it all sort of wraps itself up in a nice little bow. For the less important characters like Marco and Bijene, you could still probably squeeze them in somewhere. If not, there could still be regular arcade modes with light-hearted endings and such. I mean, Street Fighter 6 does that along with World Tour. Oops, brought up Street Fighter 6 again. That's another shot, guys. So the gameplay is admittedly not something I've speculated too much about. I'm pretty confident in SNK's ability to make a fun video game. Because KO with 15 is fun. I do think they should ape modern controls from Street Fighter 6, though, not that I'll be using them. Lots of normies seem to love them, and it just makes the game a hell of a lot more accessible. And like I said, we want to get as many of those cunts on board as possible with this game. Other than that, I feel like just retaining the regular Fatal Fury style would work fine. Could incorporate some of the KOF's movement options like rolling or short hops, I don't know. Yeah, there are Mark of the Wall's original fighting mechanics like TOP and Just Defense, and while they are present in Mark of the Wall's, I don't really think they're essential mechanics to the game. You could take them or leave them. But on the subject of making the game accessible to the uninitiated peons of the world, we have to ask ourselves what normies hate about fighting games the most. I think the biggest answer to that is getting absolutely mating pressed in the corner after getting hit once. Strive put a band-aid on this with its breakable walls, and I think that was pretty smart. However, in Strive you get launched to an entirely different section of the stage to continue fighting. Maybe Garo 2 could do it real bout style, and where once the walls break, it's instant death, there's a ring out. All the opponent would have to do after getting a beating in the corner would to be escape once, and then suddenly the aggressor is in extreme danger of dying in a pit of their own making since they damaged the wall so much previously. Now, I'm not a fighting game dev, so I don't know if bringing that mechanic back would be genius or complete cancer. So, yeah, it's just an idea. On the same wavelength, there's also the lane switching, which could mitigate fireball spam, which is another thing that newcomers struggle with. I've never particularly enjoyed the lane system, but I don't think it's an inherently bad idea. I think it could be really fun if they messed around with its implementation. And just real quick before we get into the roster, I just want to talk about the smaller details and flourishes I'd like the game to have. These are things that old Neo Geo titles were chock full of and slowly got filtered out of newer fighting games. What I mean is stuff like Rock's jacket flowing down the stream on Gato stage in Mark of the Wars, or particularly strong moves causing a spurt of blood to come out of the opponent. Battle damage like Art of Fighting, just shit like that, small touches that add soul, sorry for using that phrase. Imagine if counter hits would be accompanied by an extra crunchy sounding hit effect with the opponent to suddenly spit out a bunch of blood if they get hit in the face, or even puke up a little if they get hit in the stomach. You know, putting the fatal back in Fatal Fury, you know? Just any scenario or part of the game where there's an opportunity to add like a small little personal touch, they should just do it because, because it just really makes the game stand out and feel like it was, you know, crafted with passion and not just, you know, thoughtlessly shit out by a corporate think tank. I'm biting my tongue trying not to mention Street Fighter 6 again. But come on, that game is full of that shit. And now it's time for the fun part. The roster. Who do I want in Garo 2? Or at the very least, who do I think is going to show up? So what I'm going to do for this section of the video is go through each character and talk a little bit about them, explain my reasoning for putting them on the roster, what I think they should do in the narrative, or what I think they bring to the game, you know, that kind of thing. And for a lot of characters, specifically Fatal Fury veterans and new additions, I have a lot of custom art and art edits redesigning them with the time skip between old games and Mark of the Wolves era in mind. 
Obviously, I'll have more to say about some characters than others, especially with a lot of Mark of the Wolves veterans, but I'll try to give as many thoughts as I can per character. I've created this roster template with 20 slots, which is the highest number of characters I'm willing to include, considering all the other goals I've outlined in this video. And this isn't even counting a possible Marie Heinlein boss character. But anyway, let's actually get to the list. First of all, we have Rock Howard. This may come as a shock, but I believe that Rock Howard should be included in Garo 2. But in all seriousness, I've already talked about Rockatan already, so there's not really much for me to say here. But I'll reiterate some of the stuff I did talk about. I'd like for the story to focus on his moral dilemma of working with Kane just to get information on his mother, that kind of thing. Moveset wise, something along the same lines as his KO with 15 moveset would do just fine. Maybe a new move or two would definitely be nice to see. As for his design, it wouldn't change a thing. Don't fix what isn't broken. Next up, K&R Heinlein. This is a character we really didn't know much about in the first game despite him being the big bad overall. So hopefully we get a deep dive on his history and motives as a villain and a, of course a follow up on his implication that his sister is still alive. Other than that, uh, well it looks like they changed his hairstyle based on the original Evo teaser. So that's cool. Next we have Billy Kane. So man, do I have some shit to say about Billy. He's probably the single character I am most intrigued to see depicted in the Mark of the Wolves time frame. I want to know how Geese's death affected him mentally and how his alliance might have been challenged since. I can imagine him being introspective, not really sure if he's a good guy or a bad guy anymore. I want to know his thoughts on Kane, Rock, Terry and Joe after all these years have passed. As you can see, this is the first character I've drawn original art for and redesigned. I thought like a uh, disheveled look would work for him, so I gave him these tatted up jeans and jacket with an old beat up polo shirt. I also took some inspiration from his KOF 14 design overall with certain features like the hood and the boots. Something I've mentioned in previous videos is that I really like time skip designs that remove key parts of a character's design while still retaining their energy and keeping them as familiar as possible. In Terry's case, his trademark cap and ponytail were changed, but his Mark of the Wolves design still feels extremely Terry Bogard in spite of that. With Billy, his signature feature is obviously his bandana. While I haven't completely removed it, I did wrap it around his leg like the 14 design does, but obviously I didn't replace it with another one. Instead I gave him his undercut man bun thing that he sports in KOF Destiny and the Fatal Fury Pachinko thing. While it looks absolutely horrific in those instances, I think the hairstyle itself works pretty well on Billy if it was just done a little better. What I really don't want to see in this game is Billy acting the same as ever, still fiercely loyal to Geese and all of that crap, which is unfortunately how I predict it will go. Next is Terry Bogard. I didn't change anything about his design because, well, why would you try and tweak perfection? But I drew him anyway because I'm not going to skimp out on an opportunity to draw Terry Bogard. I did give him his bangs back though, which newer iterations of the Mark of the Wolves design have unfortunately stripped from him. Anyway, I can see Terry being the secondary protagonist of Garrow 2. And like I said, I'd like part of the story campaign to be the player controlling him, exploring Southtown, picking up info on Kane and stuff. I feel like he'd be a good vehicle for players to experience most of the plot through, since he's much more of a sort of everyman blank canvas than Rock, whose actions or thoughts might not be ones that the player agrees with. Apart from that, there's not really much else I can say about Terry, but I'd like to see certain moves return like his power charge wrecker, his fire kick, and that goofy ass diagonal rising tackle from the Garrow 2 leagues. Next is Andy Bogard. This is a character me and SNK will never agree in terms of what to do with him. Although I do like his current Garrow 2 costume, I decided to design my own look for him. It's inspired by a couple different things, EX Andy from Real Art Special, his design from KOF 2002, that badass ult for Andy in KOF 13, man that thing looks sick. I couldn't decide if I should have his hair down or tied up like in Fatal Fury 3, I went for the latter for this drawing but either would be fine. I gave him this cool little scarf as well which I used to try and keep the fire motif of his outfit alive. Although I also added a flame pattern on his pants anyway because the design ended up looking a little plain without it. Overall I'm really happy with it, I think he looks cool. I really hope they take inspiration from the Real Bout series in his KOF 2002 iteration for his moveset and give him some source, because Andy's been pretty dry in his recent appearances. Hashtag make Andy Bogard cool again. As for his involvement in the story, I imagine he'd be in Japan with Mai and Hoka tomorrow until something happens that it makes him return to Southtown once more. In my ultimate fan wank wishes, I would have the game end with a cliffhanger where Kane reveals the truth about his heritage to him and that he is the first son of Geese Howard, setting Andy up as the villain for the next game in the series. But I understand that the chances of that happening are slim to none. Still, I don't know where else this franchise goes story-wise after Rock's arc is all wrapped up. Next up is Joe Higashi. Joe wouldn't really have much to do in the story. He'd be hanging around with the Bogard bros as usual, aiding them in their quests. So let's move right onto the design. I mentioned that I didn't like Joe's Gara 2 look at all earlier. 
It just looks incredibly basic and plain. So here's my take on Joe 10 years later. I took a lot of inspiration from various Falcoon artworks of Joe, with the lack of the headband, the super long and crazy hair, and the facial hair, and, and all the necklaces and jewelry he has around him and stuff. I also gave him his awesome cape from KOF 2002, his shorts from KOF 14 because I really like how those look. His shorts from 15 would also look great, or maybe an entirely new design for them. Anything is better than just the same old plain orange shorts. I think this design that I've made for him really communicates him being like a chilled out Muay Thai champ with all the money and fame in the world. The actual Gara 2 Joe just looks like he's nipping down to the convenience store real quick. Next is Mai Shiranui. When you're bringing back Fatal Fury veterans, the most obvious choice is Mai. There's no shot in hell she wasn't coming back for Gara 2, and I'm not sure what her relevance in the story would be, but I do know exactly how I'd want her to look. More hardcore fans will recognise that I've given her the Another My Maximum Impact alt costume as her default look for Garo 2. That's because I think it looks like a perfect time skip design for Mai, even though that's not what it was intended to be. The colours are awesome, I like the maple leaf motif, the bells are cool, the hair is cool. It's just a way fucking cooler outfit compared to her default. Even if they didn't use this design straight up in Garo 2, it would be great to see them at least take notes from it, because I think it... It just sort of looks like a more mature Mai Shiranui in general. I don't know, I just get that vibe from it. Next up is Blue Mary, another super obvious choice for a returning Fatal Fury character. I want to see the main Fatal Fury 5 all meet up again 10 years later. That being said, I didn't have many ideas for an original Mary redesign. Mary actually has the rare distinction of being a Fatal Fury veteran that we've already seen in the Mark of the Wolves time period with their appearance in Mary's Astray Wolves. So while I did want to think of something original, I ultimately ended up just going for a design in that because it admittedly is very good already. The only addition I did make was give her the KOF 14 boho cinch belt with a whip thing. Whatever it is, it looks absolutely badass so definitely keep it. I messed around with her colours a bit as well and ended up with this which looks a bit closer to her real belt design. I've always preferred how she looks in the later real belt titles, so I don't know, I kind of prefer this colour scheme. Fatal Fury in general doesn't have a ton of characters where green and blue are prominent parts of their palettes, so the more the better. I don't know, maybe you don't agree, maybe you prefer the uh, Memories of Stray Wolves colour scheme. Either is fine, it's a good design regardless. But that's going to cover all the Fatal Fury veterans on this roster, now we're going to move on to the returning Mark of the Wolves fighters. First up is Kim Jae Hoon. The Kim twins feel like no-brainers to include, and uh... Well, I'm really drawing a blank here. It will probably be the same story for a lot of other Mark of the Wolves characters. They should just come back because... Why not? Uh, here's Don Juan. I do think these two would benefit from redesigns to make their different personalities more apparent, but I honestly couldn't think of anything, and I've already drawn enough shit for this video as is. Moving on to the next character, we have my personal favourite Mark of the Wolves newcomer excluding Rock, Hoku Tomaru. You know, I see a lot of people shit on this little fella. Fuck you if you don't rock with Hoku Tomaru. You're banned from watching this video. Anyway. If I may break continuity here for a second to talk about the City of the Wolves trailer, it seems to indicate that Hoku Tomorrow's balls may have dropped, so he could potentially be a bit older in this game. Which is fine. I mean, I like him being a cheeky little monkey, but at least time is actually passing in one fucking SNK franchise. Also, something I didn't really mean to implement but kind of happened anyway is that every user of the Shirinui style has a red scarf or cape thingy, which is a neat indicator of how they fight. Next up we have Marco Rodriguez, another one of my personal favourites from the Mark of the Wolves lot. I wouldn't touch his moveset because he's already super badass, but I would maybe tweak his design. Perhaps add some additional detailing to his gi since the plain white is a little... well, plain. Could add some kanji like Ryo and Yuri have in KOF 14 or some kind of decorative pattern just to make him stand out a little bit more, you know? Moving on we have Jene Burn or B Jene. And I mean, come on, probably the biggest no-brainer to return out of all the Mark of the Wolves newcomers. Hugely popular character, in fact quite a while ago I asked Twitter to pick one Mark of the Wolves characters to not return for the sequel, and from 138 responses not a single person said B. Jene. Yes, some people even said Rock and Terry. I, I, I'm, good luck. Anyway, I have nothing of substance to say about Jene. I like her, but I just have no thoughts about her. Just make sure she's not top fucking one character in this game, okay? Next is Teezog. Every game needs a grappler, and they don't come better than a big bird man. Considering the King of Dinosaurs shtick in KOF, I wonder if they'll switch up the animal he's playing as again. But personally, I'd prefer if they just keep the griffin mask because it looks so cool. Hey, doesn't it kind of sound like Teezog is shouting DO COOL when he does that one move? Next up, Hotaru Futaba. All I really wonder is if they're gonna retain her big gasm super. Man, it is really hard to think of stuff to say about the Mark of the Wolves returnees. Uh, 
Along the same line as Hotoro, we have Gato. Both Hotoro and Gato are super popular, so no question in having them come back. But uniquely compared to some of the other Mark the Wolves newcomers, they actually have a, like a relevant storyline that needs to be finished. Well, apart from a certain other two. But uh, this actually wraps up all the Mark of the Wolves newcomers. Yeah, I didn't bring back Kevin or Freeman. In that same poll I mentioned, once I'd tallied up all the responses, Kevin and Freeman were the most popular cuts. And considering I want to add some new characters while keeping the roster size reasonable, I just couldn't justify them. Anyway, from here we're going to move on to new characters, which should be more interesting to talk about. First up is Quan Conta, who you'll probably recognise as one of the characters that was originally going to appear in Garo 2 before it got cancelled. So, why did I pick her to revive? Well, I kinda just like her design in general. Also, Fatal Fury as a franchise is a gigantic sausage party, so that's something I think needs some balancing out. Also, with Rock and Hawker tomorrow, we have Disciples of Terry and Andy respectively, so Quan rounds out that trilogy. Oh, yeah, she's uh, Joe's disciple. Almost forgot to mention that. Although the most interesting thing about her is that she's actually already possibly canon in King of Fires. You never see her at all, but she's mentioned twice in Team Fatal Fury's KOF 12 team story, as well as Joe's wing quote against Cooler in KOF 13. So she's the one part of the cancelled Garo 2 that actually survived in some way, so I see no reason not to introduce her properly in this game. Next up is the only fully original newcomer I created. And, well, it's still not a massively original concept or anything, but we have the daughter of Stroheim. Yep, that's Wolfgang Krause's kid. Haven't actually come up with a name for her though. What's a super regal and evil sounding German girl's name? Annalise? Some shit like that. If you're uninitiated, you might be wondering why I didn't just include Krauser. That's because Krauser's dead. I thought this was common knowledge, but it was a huge source of debate among the SK fandom on Twitter recently. There's arguments for both sides, I, I guess. But I think the evidence for him being dead is overwhelming. But I'm not going to get into the whole shebang, maybe I'll cover it in a future video. Regardless, I made this character to put a band-aid on two things. First of all is the aforementioned lack of pussy in the Fatal Fury series. With her, it brings the total female characters up to six, which still isn't a great ratio, but it's decent enough to where I don't think it sticks out as an issue anymore. The other thing is that I don't think canonically dead characters should be included as playable since it really deafened the impact and finality that is, well, their death. Same thing with geese, and no, putting a fucking halo above them doesn't fix that. So this character acts as a Krauser function without breaking the continuity. Plus, I think it'd be an interesting character to explore. Does she follow in her father's footsteps? Does she disavow her father's actions like Rock does with geese? Yeah, that kind of thing. As for her design, she originally had Krauser's exact same colour scheme, but it ended up looking way too much like a gender swap to me. So I messed around with the colours, added some additional detailing based on the portrait of Rudolf Krauser from the second OVA, just tried to make her a little more distinct from her dad. Didn't want to tiptoe too far out of the core idea though. Next up is Geki... Ke... Kebao? Kebao? <laughs> this is the father of Gato and presumably Hotaro as well, who we know is in cahoots with Kane based on Gato's ending in Mark of the Wolves. He's also one of the characters from the Garo 2 prototype. I actually originally didn't include him, but I eventually realised, hey, I'm bringing back Hotaro and Gato. Their story hasn't been wrapped up yet, I can't not put him in the game. I'm not massively invested in this plot thread, but I am curious to know why he killed his wife and why he's working with Kane. And I want to see some kind of resolution for Hotaro and Gato. That said, I don't really have any other thoughts about him. And now we have the final character on the roster, my personal favourite character design from the original Garo 2, Dolvik Born. I looked up Dolvik since it sounded like a real name, but all I found were Dolvik K Pain Relief tablets. I'm getting these names from the SNK Wiki's page on Garo 2, by the way. I know I'm normally a stickler for details, but to be honest, I don't really give a shit if these are accurate or not. Anyway, this guy is fucking awesome. There's no way I wasn't including him based on his design alone. Look at the motherfucker. Don't know what he would do in the story, what his role would be, don't really care. He just looks awesome. It also means there'd be two black characters on the roster, and you know, that kind of diversity never hurts. If I had to hazard a guess, he'd be either working with Kane as some sort of Mr. Big type enforcer, or be head of a rival gang instead. If hypothetically I could only bring one character over from the prototype, it'd be Dolvik. No question. So yeah, that's the roster totaling at 20 characters. And to be honest, I think that could possibly be pushing it. I'm certainly not comfortable going any higher than that. Also, just as part of making this silly little mock-up character select screen, I shout out these two kind of crappy Rock and Terry renders in Blender that I then painted over. And as a joke intended to not be taken seriously, I did the whole blurry picture leak thing, and put them up on Twitter with some very obvious joke captions. So of course, they started spreading all over, and people took them seriously. Some people even thought they were real, under the tweet that was captioned ZOMG Gary's Mod 2 leaked. 
A lot of people responded to them really well and hoped that they were real, or at least hoped that that's how the real Gara 2 would look. So that was nice, thank you if you were one of them. Uh, I think they actually looked a lot better on the leaks than they do at their actual definitions, but still, I appreciate it. A lot of other people fucking hated them and started Doom posting about how they were reusing 15 models and that they looked shitty and stuff, which was pretty entertaining as well. But in a way, I think it was a good thing, because it means the fanbase has a pretty high standard they're holding SNK2 with Garo 2, and they are going to settle for brushed up KOF models. Anyway, yeah, they're fake and I just made them for this video. And that's the complete roster. However, you guys know me. I wouldn't stop there. After all, we're all so cucked by the state of this fucking industry that whenever we speculate on upcoming video game rosters, or fighting game rosters, we automatically include DLC in that discussion because it's just a given at this point. So let's be conservative and give ourselves three seasons of DLC, each with four characters. Well, except for the last one, which were five, but you'll see why. That's more or less what Samshow 2019 and KOF 15 have gotten. So let's jump into it with the first DLC character, Duck King. Additional DLC characters for this game give us an opportunity to bring back some more obscure, but still beloved characters from Fatal Fury. So why not start with one of the most hideously underrated characters in SNK's catalogue? Duck has been out of the game for so long, his comeback is long overdue. Now like Blue Mary, there already exists a Garo era designed for Duck King in Memories of Stray Wolves. But I'm not really that big of a fan of it, to be honest. I think it works for a more casual outfit, but as one he fights in, I'm not so sure. So I came up with this one which is pretty randomly inspired by Bomb Funk MC's freestyle and music video. In fact, the jacket he's wearing is near identical to the one that Kid in the video is wearing. From there I decided to go with a Y2K aesthetic, which I think is a cool evolution of his classic 80s hip-hop outfit. Gave him sunglasses similar to the ones all those German dudes wear, you've seen Europop. Also those weird headphones that were pretty popular in the early 2000s. I even sampled the purple highlight colour from the KOF 2000 logo, which is probably the most Y2K looking thing I've ever seen in my life. You may also note that I gave him Java Sparrows, and if you know me, you're probably thinking that my girlfriend asked me to include them. But I actually came up with that idea myself, because I thought their colour scheme would look a lot better with the new design. You might say, well those are sparrows, not ducks. I hate to break it to you, but neither were the chicks he always had with him. Next character is Alice. This is an extremely controversial character, and I don't really get why because she was an oppressive top tier in KOF 14. Okay, big deal. People still like Cronin and Bijene. Shit man, Yori is strong in every game and is still extremely beloved. Because she originated from a pachinko machine? What do you have, PTSD from the SK pachinko era? She's basically Terry Bogard's Sakura, and she literally topped an official Street Fighter popularity poll. Anyway, the pachinko game Alice stars in is actually set in the Mark the Walls era, so if there's any game I would expect Alice to show up in, it's Garo too. But uh, here's a little idea I had regarding Alice. You know who always gets a bunch of requests to return in some way? Fatal Cutie from SNK Heroin. I mean Heroines. Now, I hate the Fatal Cutie, and I certainly don't want it to be playable for some fucking reason. But if Alice wore that outfit, eh, yeah, that works for me, and it actually makes sense considering her character. I once saw some fan art on Twitter of Terry alongside Fatal Cutie, and they gave it like a pink tint to her clothes, and uh, I actually thought it looked pretty good, so I incorporated that here. I also decumified the design a bit, because I mean, Jesus Christ. Her underwear was showing, bro. Maybe this would work better as an alt, which I wouldn't mind since I like Alice's KOF 14 design a lot anyway. But I just think this was a cool idea that kind of brings back a highly requested character in another way. Next up is Mr. Karate 2. It took a considerable amount of restraint to not stick this guy in the base roster because God damn, do I want to see Boomer Rio show up in this game. Would love to see them switch up his moveset big time. With Marco covering the basic Kyokugan moveset, they have a lot of freedom to depict the absolute peak of the style. It could give him some KOF with 30 Mr. Karate stuff, or maybe just a bunch of new moves. Just make him strong as shit and badass as hell. You know that one panel of the Baruki 1 manhwa where he just effortlessly flicks Guy Tendo into a concrete wall? That should be the basis for how he plays. As for his design, use the badass outfit he has in Wild Ambition, or the one you see here which is a piece of KOF 14 concept art for an up costume that never happened. Such a sick design. And the last character for our hypothetical first season is none other than Rick Stroud. This fucking guy got cut such a raw deal. As if getting booted out of KOF 99 in favour of Lee cocking Zhang Fei wasn't bad enough, a game later his moveset gets appropriated by a white woman. Ouch! Fatal Fury has a lot of sick underrated characters, and Rick is just the pinnacle of them in my opinion. Native American boxer cowboy dude. Anyway, I don't think Rick's design really needs to be changed, but I tried my hand at it anyway to see what I could come up with. 
I tried to reinforce the whole cowboy thing he's got going on with the boots and the cutlass jeans, which I think look pretty awesome. The vest and shirt didn't turn out looking as cool as I imagined, but whatever, I still think they're okay. Rick is one of the few characters where I honestly wouldn't mind if he showed up in Garo 2 looking identical to how he did in Real Bar 2. I mean, this is a character who truly didn't get much of a chance to shine to begin with. So that does it for the first season. Moving on to the next one, we open with another art of fighting veteran, King. Out of the whole AOF cast, I think after Rio, I'd be most intrigued to see how King is getting on. Is she still bartending? Still fighting? Hitched with Rio? Did they have sex and produce an offspring? Many questions that deserve answers. For her, I just edited her KOF 14 concept art and made an outfit heavily based on yet another unused DLC costume from that game, although I did alter it a bit. I think it's a pretty fitting design for an older king, you know, the black really works with her. But I'd also be down to see her embrace her masculine roots again and bring back the jacket and all that shit. As long as she looked super prim and proper and classy, I'm super down for her to show up in this game. Plus, King is my KOF mid, so always helps. Moving on, we have Bob Wilson. Bob's always been a personal favourite of mine, and I've been gunning for his return for years. Just a really fun character all around. Plus he's, what, the second Caparisto in fighting game history? That's a cool claim to fame. When I started thinking about redesigning Bob, I know I wanted something classy like how we often see him in KOF games as Pale Pale Cafe's secondary manager. I was also just struck with some random inspiration and based him on how Andre 3000 looked in the music video to Hey Ya. I seem to get a lot of inspiration from music, it's weird. I originally didn't plan on changing his hair, but as I was drawing him I thought, why not try and think of something? And I started scrolling through a bunch of dreadlock hairstyles and just sort of eyeballed them while scribbling out the shape of his hair, which I then tried to make sense of by detailing it. I actually ended up liking how it came out quite a bit, but I did think it might have been too strong a deviation from his original design, so I made an art with his classic hair just for good measure. Honestly, I like both. Next up is Kevin Ryan. Or Ryan. Whatever they want to call him. Rejoice, Kevin fans! Eh, I don't know if either of you are watching this video or exist. The only thing I'm really interested in with Kevin is revealing what his relation to Blue Mary actually is. Are they cousins? Brother and sister? Is he a fucking dad? It'd be fun to see some interaction between the two. There's also his whole storyline with Freeman, but whoops, he's not in the game yet, so uh, sorry about that. Well, my train of thought was already stopped. On to the next character. To cap off our second season, we have Ryuji Yamazaki. Yeah, this dude was pretty much a given. Admittedly, I didn't have much of an idea of what an older Yamazaki would look like, but I remembered seeing some KOF 14 concept art where he had no shirt on, and you could see his Yakuza tattoos. So I thought it'd be cool if he actually showed them in-game, because, you know, the fact that he's a Yakuza isn't really an aspect of the character we get reminded of all that often. Especially not in KOF since there's more of a spotlight on the fact that he's, uh, part of the Hakushu. In fact, I don't even know if Yamazaki is Yakuza in, in KOF. Anyway, from there I just gave him his sick fur coat and, uh, yeah, that'll do. And yes, I know you're not supposed to show your fucking Yakuza tats, but come on, this is Ryuji goddamn Yamazaki, you think he gives a shit? Also, give this man his knife back. He misses it. So with that, we wrap up the second season of DLC and move on to the third and final season, which, like I mentioned earlier, will have five characters and you'll see why with the first character, Jin Chon Rei. The Jins were only teenagers in the original games, so I'd be interested to see how they've grown up and differentiated themselves over time. As you may know, after Fatal Fury 3, the Jins went to train under two different masters. Chon Rei went with Tung, and Chon Shu went with Kim. So while their movesets would have a lot of similarities, they'd be very distinct as well. Chon Rei could retain aspects of his original moveset, but could also act as a tongue function as well. I didn't have a massively clear vision of his design, but I think what I came up with is pretty cool. With the blue kung fu pants with the Chinese pattern on them. I also based his hair on Super Saiyan 3 Goku because... I don't know, I just had the idea randomly and wanted to draw it. The boots are admittedly a little out of place, but... Give me a break, the creative juices are starting to run dry at this point. So next is obviously Jin Chon Shu. Here is my pitch for turning this Fatal Fury D-lister into a social media sensation. It's a two-hit combo. First, you give him K-pop inspired clothes. This isn't even far-fetched considering they trained under Kim, and therefore would probably spend a lot of time or even live in South Korea. So you get those weirdo stan people on board. Then second, you pull a Bridget on Chon Shu and turn him into a girl. Congratulations, Chon Shu is now permanently trending and is a massively popular character. You're welcome, SNK, you're welcome. In all seriousness, I thought the K-pop angle would be cool even though I know fuck all about the genre. So I surfed Google Images until I found some stuff I could finagle into a Chon Shu outfit. Oh, and they would incorporate some Taekwondo into their moveset from their training under Kim. Despite the fact that I didn't have very clear visions for time skip designs of the Jin twins, I ended up being pretty happy with how they turned out. Moving on, we have the final Mark of the Wolves veteran that is still not on this roster. Freeman. I mean, apart from Grant, but be honest, did you even remember him until I just now mentioned him? I don't specifically dislike Freeman at all, but he is pretty out of left field in Mark the Walls and always felt a little out of place to me. 
That said, I do think he deserves to come back. He just wasn't a massive priority for me. Hey, now we can finish the Kevin Freeman story now that all the pieces have been finally put into the game. Yeah, it doesn't exactly work out great this way, but I don't think that many people are going to cry foul if that storyline gets left hanging compared to the other ones. Next up, as our semi-final character, is the big fat cunt Raiden. Anyone who has seen my Fatal Fury character ranking video is aware of my embarrassing affinity for this character. And honestly, I don't know why I've placed him so far along in the DLC cycle. Raiden occupies an interesting position in the world of fighting games because, as far as I know of, he's the only hill wrestler that comes to mind. I mean, at least in more mainstream fights, I can't think of anyone else. Is Hugo a hill? I don't even fucking know. King of Dinosaurs doesn't count, he can't stop playing the hero. So obviously, this game already has a face wrestler in Tzok. So I figured for Raiden, his redesign could riff off of that. I wanted to give Raiden an animal motif, specifically the natural predator to Tzok's one. Unfortunately, Tzok's mask is based on the griffin, which is a mythical creature that's basically a mix of a lion and an eagle. Even still, eagles don't even have predators, they are top of the food chain. So my fuck it adjustment was to just think to myself, hey, uh, don't snakes fuck around with birds sometimes? And thus, this design was shut out of my head. I gave his wrestling outfit an anaconda pattern and redesigned his mask to look uh, almost kind of Aztec-y. However, I didn't want to stop there. If you know a bit of wrestling, you're probably aware that Raiden is based on the late Big Van Vader, who was a pro wrestler very popular in Japan in the 80s and 90s. And Vader often came into the ring wearing this sick-ass Mastodon helmet. So I wanted to give Raiden a similar helmet as well to continue the snake motif, and designed one based on a King Cobra. I was pretty happy with it, but it looked a little plain to me, a little rounded. Then I realised the coolest thing about the Mastodon helmet were the big ass horns. You can't give a snake big horns. Unless... Uh, what's a mythical creature associated with the snakes? A serpent? Can't those have horns? And thus, I gave it sick horns. Now I have no idea if this is even something he'd wear in the match, maybe, maybe it shows up in his battle intro and outro, or, or maybe he puts it on for his super special move, that'd be fucking badass. Alright, time for the final character of the final season, and it is none other than the GOD HIMSELF, Luke Sullivan. Yeah, you didn't think you were gonna be able to escape from all that crossover shit, did you? Samurai Shodan had three of them. Four if you count Hibiki from The Last Blade. So yeah, I think it's safe to assume that Fatal Fury will probably include at least one crossover character. And what company does everyone want to see SNK crossover with again? Capcom, obviously. It really doesn't matter which character you pick, you could literally draw one from a hat randomly and they'd all have the same effect. So why did I pick Luke? Any particular reason? Well, I simply felt like drawing him. We all got our dicks tickled at EVO 2022 when those Capcom X SNK posters were given out. So I think a Street Fighter rep would act as a way to test the waters even further and prime us for an eventual Capcom vs SNK 3 announcement. That would be so sweet. Although perhaps you're a franchise puritan and don't want any crossover schlock in the new Fatal Fury. And honestly, that's completely fair. The genre has certainly been oversaturated with crossovers in the last decade. So I have an alternative final character in case you'd prefer that. Nightmare Geese. But hang on just a fucking minute. Didn't I say earlier that I didn't want dead characters to return because it lessens the impact of them even being dead in the first place, even if their appearance is non-canon? Yeah. And I stand by that. Although, come on. Three seasons of DLC later, the final character? Game is like two or three years old at this point. There has been plenty of time to take in the absence of Geese Howard. So you know what? Artistic merit be damned. For the final roster slot, just give the people Geese. And that'll wrap up the final roster of the game, standing 33 characters tall. Now of course, there were omissions that I regret or characters I would've liked to include, like Alfred, Robert Garcia, Cheng Zinzan, Sokaku, the list goes on. But I wanted to keep this video somewhat realistic instead of being one of those fan rosters that have like, six Gorillion characters on it. And so, those are my ideas for Garo 2. And it bears repeating, this video is not me saying this is how Garo 2 should be. It's just a lot of fun wondering about how I would do things if I was miraculously given control of the game. It probably got a little bit out of hand, but you know, whatever. Now, I'm gonna be honest, I don't even know what SNK in this day and age is capable of producing, like genuinely. They've been talking up a big game recently, but hey, that could be all that, just talk. Like if KOF 15 is SNK's highest output, then Garo 2 is absolutely fucked. But at the same time, maybe I don't believe in them enough. Maybe they'll shatter my expectations and hit this out of the park. I really don't know, it could go either way. Uh, but I'm in SNK hater mode right now because it will just help leave in the blow if the game does turn out to be mid. It's probably obvious to anyone watching this video considering how much I've been referencing it. I absolutely love Street Fighter 6. Never been a Street Fighter guy, never been a fan, 
but I picked up six and I think it is such a goddamn achievement for the genre and should be the blueprint for every game following it to aim for. Absolutely my game of the year 2023, no questions. So of course I want a new game in my favourite video game series to reach those heights and kick ass. Now it might be silly for me to say SNK, a smaller company, should just like make a game as good as Capcom, which is a much bigger company, but can you really blame me with how much they've hyped themselves up recently? I just want them to make an awesome game. No caveats, no asterisks. Please, God, just let Garo 2 be good.